since October or September. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, it's a long time. <laughs> are you plotting your way back home or are you staying comfortably put? Um, I am. I am live on YouTube plotting my way back home. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I think uh, next week we should be coming to the UK. So I think we should now be ready to start. Let me just check. Yes, Martino, we can start right now. Great. Great session, everyone. So, hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth session of the second season of Shelter in Places, a public program organized by the students and the researchers at the new Center for Research and Practice. My name is Martina Cavalot, and tonight I'm joined by artist Lawrence Abuhamdan and critic Nora Khan. So thank you both for being here with us and welcome to our screen space. Thank um, you. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. The title of the discussion that we're going to have tonight is Computational Risk and Algorithmic Horizons. And it will largely revolve around machine vision and machine speech, software neutrality and algorithmic violence. Um, I'm just going to take a brief moment to make a few preliminary statements and then I can introduce our guests and we'll move forward with our conversation. Since the emergence of media theory, our discourse has struggled to incorporate criticism when considering technological interventions across different geographies and scales. The proliferation of digital surveillance and predictive software has fostered the myth of code as an impartial and neutral agent, which is only beginning to be publicly dispelled. With this conversation, we will try to individuate the space for a computation that exceeds the dynamic of the calculus and harness its tools to examine the possibilities for the ethical deployment of algorithmic arbitration. In addressing machine vision and machine speech across law and order, we will consider questions of form, matter and process to pass how different conceptual apparatuses are mobilized in the making of computational meaning and how this affects the horizon of the human. So when I was organizing this panel, um, I was thinking a lot about how the word technology does a lot of ideological heavy lifting and how its premises don't often get sufficiently unpacked um, because we get very easily tricked by the blinding lights of its effects. So I wanted to kind of take a step back to reflect on it more as in a material apparatus um, whose structure and deployment is worth uh, maybe looking at. And um, I wanted to especially do this because I've noticed um, over recent years and particularly over the recent months, a rise of a certain kind of very nefarious techno solutionism that we need to address. Um, and so I'm very pleased to be joined by two cultural practitioners who make various kinds of gestures in regards to computation in their um, own practices. Lauren Sabu Hamdan is a private year. Um, his audio investigations have been used as evidence at the UK Asylum and Immigration Tribunal and as advocacy for organizations such as Amnesty International and Defense for Children International, together with fellow researchers for, from forensic architecture. Habu Hamdan completed his PhD in 2017 from Goldsmiths College, University of London and is currently a fellow at the Gray Center for Arts and Inquiry at the University of Chicago. Abu Hamdan has exhibited his work at the 58th Venice Biennale, the 11th Guangzhou Biennale, and the 13th and 14th Sharjah Biennale, Witte de Witte in Rotterdam, Tay Modern Tanks, Chisenhill, Hame Museum in LA, Porticus in Frankfurt, the showroom in London, and Casco in Utrecht. His works are part of collection at MoMA, Guggenheim, Van Habe Museum, Centre Pompidou, and Tate Modern. Habu Amdan's work has been awarded the 2019 Edward Munch Art Award, the 2016 Namjoon Paik Award for New Media, and in 2017, his film Rubber Coated Steel won the Tiger Shaw Film Award at the Rotterdam International Film Festival. For the 2019 Turner Prize, Abu Hamdan, together with nominated artists Helen Kamek, Oscar Murillo, and Tai Shani, formed a temporary collective in order to be jointly granted the award. Nora Khan is a writer of criticism. 
She is on the faculty of Rhode Island School of Design, Digital and Media, teaching critical theory, artistic research, writing for artists and designer, and technological criticism. She has two short books, Seeing, Naming, Knowing on Machine Vision and with Stephen Warwick, Fear Indexing the X-Files on fan forums and conspiracy theories online. Forthcoming this year is The Artificial and the Real through our Metropole. She is currently an editor of The Force of Art along with Karen Crony and Moses Sarubiri and is a longtime editor at Rhizom. She publishes in Art in America, Freeze, Flash Art, Moose, Four Columns, Broken Rail, Rhizome, Spike Art, The Village Voice, and Glass Bead. She has written commissioned essays for exhibitions at Serpentine Galleries, Chisholm Hill, the Venice Biennale, Saint Pompidou, Swiss Institute, and Kunstverein in Hamburg. This year, as the Shed's first guest curator, she organized the exhibition Manual Override, featuring Sandra Perry, Simon Fujiwara, Morishin Halayari, Lynn Hirschman Leeson, and Martin Sims. So again, thank you to you both for being here. Um, so to kick off our conversation, I wanted to discuss kind of how as of late, um, we seem to have suffered from a progressive loss of informality. And as the constant presence of data processing systems around us have kind of forced us into this perpetual performative corner. Um, we have sometimes referred to this as a phenomenon of um, a, a collapse of the apparatus of the casual or the death of the inconsequential exchange. And Lawrence used uh, these words time ago saying that all the speech that we utter is liable wherever we are. Um, and this obviously goes with images too. So in this state of perpetual liability, um, I was wondering if this bird's eye view has infiltrated the private space, the private consciousness and the sort of personal psychology and if we are maybe ever free from this machine representation. So um, over to you guys and Lawrence, if you'd like to give us a start, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if it's about necessarily privacy that's lost. I mean, we can speak also later about why I think why I think sometimes focusing on privacy as a, as a mode of resistance or as a, as a signifier of a kind of loss when we talk about uh, surveillance is, is perhaps the wrong way to resist it. Um, but I think it's what I, what I meant with that quote uh, in a broader context is that it's a sort of expansion of the of the space in which truth operates that um before there was moments where in which speech acts would inaugurate upon your voice a specific necessity to speak the truth oaths uh you know and then specific spaces like the interrogation room uh, the witness stand there was de there was designated sites where truth mattered and i think increasingly truth as as in fact the law has expanded itself right it's not only um you know the law um is now uh, adjudicating over things that 50 years ago it would have never done you know 20 years ago it would have never done so there's also an expansion of the legal space and with that a kind, a kind of an acceleration with with the digital i think they work hand in hand to sort of um in my eyes produce or increase the space in which truth operates and therefore the spaces where in which liability rests on our voice um and i think that that's all i, I kind of meant uh, it, it's it's not really you know it, it's an expansion of of uh, the space of uh, uh, which uh, the, the places we need to speak the truth when we sign a terms and conditions uh, thing often what we're what we're signing is is uh, is equivalent to the speech acts we, we may have uttered in in a courtroom But, but we're speaking in our homes or on the phone or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, the question of performance on video versus being authentic on video and how that has long-term consequences is really like heavily on my mind and many people's minds right now within, we're at like three, three and a half weeks of ongoing protests in the US against police brutality. And so, 
what I've been paying attention to is how US police departments deploy the language of contact tracing to trace what they loosely determine as bad actors by some obscure calculus, right? And so the changing concept of threat is ideological and radicalized and ethnocentric and nationalist. So not only speech, but movement and gestures cropped to nine or 10 seconds of video, then proliferated at scale, tagged with some bad faith in caption that anyone can interpret in many different ways, makes one liable for any kind of gesture taken out of context. So, because I'm really interested in this very dense question, very good question um, is, you know, how also at this moment, how do we internalize the logics of capture through the sustained use of our devices through like this passive watching of violent feeds um, in, you know, how we imagine ourselves seen from above as we watch these videos, how we see ourselves through this distant bird's eye at a remove. I think this, you know, widespread consciousness of an ambient watcher has affected our speech and our sense of possibility, um, you know, whether we're actively or passively surveilled. So I think it is really kind of impossible to be free from machine representation to answer that final question, given the level of algorithmic mediation of um, you know our documents and data and photos that we experience so it becomes imperative to be aware of how we contextualize frame images and to read evidence and create narrative and context to um, you know dimensionalize ourselves through them so i would measure the frame and the question of being forced into performance because we could argue that we're already performing for each other in all language and interaction based on our positions within social space so you know, women perform constantly to avoid conflict and harassment, immigrants perform belonging, people of color perform being happy. I don't know if they went during like erasure or aggression, but when we talk about policing, it's the kind of performance that active surveillance encourages, um, a performance of being someone who isn't at a risk or a threat to the state in public space or in private space that becomes like our internalized preoccupation um, and I won't say much more. I mean, I just activists and organizers right now are really thinking around that. How do you present? What do you wear in public? How do you conduct yourself during protests? And people are reforming themselves in real time according to this idea of what being a risk is um, by looking at themselves through the eyes of the state. And so that's really, yeah, that's where my mind is right now in response to that. No, thanks to both of you. That's um, very well put. And I was thinking I actually um, would like to go back to a place of looking at the premise of those kind of moments of performance, because um, there's definitely been a lot of work in theory and particularly I'm thinking about media theory of the last 20, almost 30 years um, to kind of dispel this mythology around code uh, and especially around code neutrality. And so as we are in a way moving closer to this admission that code is actually rife with ideology, um, I was um, wondering what's the right moment in which um, this ideology takes hold of the technological tool? What's the site of its birth? Because what I've noticed is that there is usually like a sequence, a sort of assembly line um, that somehow starts in education and then moves forward in police making and then in engineering and then enters implementation and then it gets um, kind of looked after by critics, uh, which is something that we do post. Um, but I was kind of wondering all these moments in this assembly line kind of uh, absolve themselves of any responsibility or of any er overall responsibility. So I was wondering where do we trace back this initial accountability? Where does this ideology take hold uh, to begin with? So maybe, uh, Nori, if you wouldn't mind starting this one off. Sure, I mean, I guess I hear less and less that code and software and the technological tool are not neutral, like that's less a, a drum one has to be, which is great. So it means the conversation can move past that, um, past the myth of code neutrality and dig instead into how neutrality is suggested. Why do we experience tools, computers, phones as tools and not as powerful symbolic structures that <laughs> mediate cognition? Why do we still call them tools or think of them as distant apolitical spaces is 
itself an ideology of neutrality that's designed for on top of political or financial imperatives. So for me working at an art and design school um, and being one of the few like criticism classes in a, in a place that's very invested in design, the work of design, at least in technology is to create that neutrality and smoothness. And that's the expression of like 30 years of software design. Um, I think is much harder once one says code is not neutral or tech is not neutral is to unpack how I, uh, the ideology of neutrality is built into software. Um, so you need to like close read interfaces, analyze mechanics, critically assess design. And it's really, it's within the design, yes, but it's also within the culture of making. It's in design education. It's expressed through, um, you know, typography, the aesthetic of your browser, um, taxonomies of data, uh, design of like this interface that we're on right now on top of infrastructures of extraction that are hard to see. So for, for me in teaching, at least like being able to close read an interface the same way you would read a painting or photo and be able to articulate and think through the choices and what different aesthetic choices mean is, is key. I have more to say, but I want more to speak to. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, exactly like Nora says, it's, it's, it's been a while since I think we thought of them fundamentally as neutral uh, things. I think, you know, for me, a kind of seminal change in discourse was the switch between Arab Spring uh, 2011 and the Syrian civil war, right? Where, uh, I, I mean, not Syria, I mean, let's call it the, the revolution that was crushed uh, brutally. Civil war is definitely not what we should call it. But um, what I want to, to say with that is that um, you had, of course, the kind of lauding of Facebook, right? This kind of free speech platform, the moment where um, uh, uh, social media, arguably the biggest censorship, uh, I mean, biggest surveillance engine in the world, Facebook is, uh, is actually um, lauded as, uh, you know, bringing about the end of, uh, of uh, um, Mubarak. And, um, and allowing the people to finally speak, right? This is the whole mm -hmm. discourse. Um, and, uh, you know, so very, I mean, ideologically you knew that it's about, you know, it, it might have been a tool that definitely helped to mob, like organize people in space, um, but it was of course always platform free speech. And by that, I mean, um, a kind of extension of American imperialism where um, the individual, where uh, free, free expression is sort of like not, um, uh, not, not in practice uh, a prerequisite, but a prerequisite to a kind of ideological space which you, you kind of um, enter and understand it to be on board with, uh, to be on the side with. But that's the things that, um, that are protected or, prote or need protecting. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that there's this kind of moment where sort of platform free speech is sort of uh, go goes around everywhere. And then what happens in the early days of the Syrian revolution, um, uh, and particularly the turn when it gets extremely violent is um, YouTube. So, so, so YouTube becomes much more the platform, um, especially after the, uh, the protest died when it started to get armed, uh, when there was armed resistance, when there was um, internal f uh, fighting between kind of paramilitary groups. And what you quickly saw is that YouTube was um, being used as a kind of violence proliferator, right? That what was going on was there was a lot of uh, re revenge acts um, that uh, started to first happen were, dis were, were disseminated, uploaded, and then a new one. And then that's what quickly led, let's say there was this whole kind of underbelly of what we didn't see. And then suddenly in the West, we circulate the scene, the scene of this guy eating the heart of another guy, if you remember. So of course, there's this, all, there's this whole kind of thread of videos that we didn't see before that, that actually proliferated kind of violence to this level. So, so is this kind of really weird shift from uh, you know, just in, in one year uh, of those platforms where we would see like them lauded as the sort of um, channels for, for free speech and then quickly flip to actually, you know, them being kind of out of control, or another sense of virality and, 
and its relationship to violence. So I think, um, I don't know, for me, that, that's a real shift in the, in, in, uh, I always remember that, that, that sort of, um, that I think that was the moment mainstream people stopped saying that um, social media platforms were responsible for, for uh, uh, Arab emancipation. Um, and started to understand another, a darker side to, to what was actually happening. I don't know if, that, I mean, it doesn't exactly answer your question, but it's, it's sort of, it's this moment where I think that, that question, that kind of position went to, to its grave. <laughs> no, it, it actually does. And um, it's kind of um, this depiction of, kind of these softwares and these um, machinics uh, interventions kind of outing themselves as something that they were hiding and trying not to be. And so I think it kind of leads me to something else that I wanted to ask, which is perhaps in regards of, given that the, we then recognize these um, visual and auditory objects as something that is political, what do we do about them? How do we reappropriate these political tools as artists, as critics, and what kind of space can we occupy there? Um, which I guess, you know, is something that you both are basing your practices on. So I'm really curious to hear um, Lawrence and Nora, what your um, opinion on this is. Yeah, I mean, could I just, I wanted to add one last thing um, that'll like move into an answer for this, which is that um, for this question of responsibility of like who's responsible for the violence that Lawrence you're just describing so well um, once that is enacted in the world I mean when a designer picks up a tool like they should have the history in mind from like cybernetics to the whole earth catalog to the personal computer um, like Buckminster Fuller famously described himself or the designer architecture engineers like floating above the earth but not really of it and then like intervening with the solution into social reality. So, you know, I just think of a rabbit hole that a lot of tech critics fall into is spending a lot of time on the tool, like on the master's tool. Um, but uh, Jack Halberstam, I think last year was revisiting Audre Lorde's quote, like the master's tool will um, never dismantle the master's house, is that we've forgotten that burning the house down was actually the whole point of her critique. And so in the case of like computation, I don't know whether this zone of counteraction, what that would mean, um, because that would suggest a theory that wins or a theory that's good as opposed to extraction. I think there just needs to be, for one, more stakeholders in technological design. Like I used to be very excited about AI as an artistic tool, but I'm a little bit much less now. Um, I don't think that everything should be made uh, I don't think certain technologies should be built because their design ends in abuse or embeds abusive and flattening ways of seeing. Um, you know, so if we take software and machine design as predicated on ideology, whether it's capitalism, extraction control, there's a far right, right AI, and then there's you know ideas of a leftist AI, an AI organized around communal transdisciplinary models of mutual aid and care. Um, so I think changing the theory would start with having multiple theories embedded in design and engineering culture, which are themselves very monolithic and powerful. And I think artists are more often influenced by design and engineering than we, one would like to think we are the other way around. Um, hum, like humanists and artists and uh, the sciences are often very much at odds. So I just think the main option is having many theories, many forms of computation. Um, a American artist who's a good collaborator said a couple of days ago in a panel that it's not likely every person can design their own computer, but you can have more people in the room than just engineers and scientists to create a hybridity of theories. Yeah, I mean, I think I've moved on my position. Um, you know, I, I, I think I did believe at some point that there was more power um, available to us than perhaps I now realize in terms of kind of uh, reclaiming the master's tools because it's essentially it's like the master's crumbs right it's not really their tools that we're having it's sort of like the little bits that fall on the ground after they're done with it um, and I think 
you know, I've, I've tried it. It, 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 it. I think, I think you, you can, you can make those comments um, based on, you know, post-colonial literature and, and stuff like that. But I think it's also important to sort of move through that as an um, exercise. And I, I, I did in 2016 build this sort of counter surveillance thing called the hummingbird clock. Um, and part of that was also about, you know, of course it's always doing, it, it's, it's never really about the platform and, and the tool and using the tool. It's also about sort of understanding rights, understanding um, a new conceptions of public space that are being articulated through technology that are um, perhaps never even cross your mind that actually belong to you, right? So uh, ways in which, you know, so, so in that particular case, it was this, um, it's, the, it's the buzz of the, of, uh, of the, you know, the main grid of the electricity. Um, and be, because, it's, uh, because it has to, it's not, to not surge, it has to be regulated by a national grid. It means the same grid is um, uh, sorry, the same buzz of the electricity is, is all over the country because it's a kind of national grid. So it's a kind of national buzz. It's a kind of national anthem, that buzz. And it never repeats itself. It, it, it constantly fluctuates um, in a very kind of small frequency uh, changes. It's, it's not uh, um, stable, uh, although it sounds stable. And so the idea is that you could take any 10 seconds and that would be a kind of unique moment in time so so if there's any recording with with the electricity buzz on it if the machine is plugged in or something like that you could actually use that and kind of timestamp those recordings and so it was about archiving that buzz and sort of having that accessible in the sense that it's about expanding what a kind of national what is national time also and how that is registered and and what kinds of networks can also be formed um, through the knowledge that they're being used as surveillance practice by the police and everything, but but I think I think sometimes let's say the master's tools propose quite radical shifts in understanding uh, our relationship to the world, um, and I think it, sometimes if 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 it's if it if we can kind of understand that conceptually and understand how that how to write and think on those levels as well, then at least I, th I feel like it's more on a kind of like, I feel it's not the tools, it's almost, it's, it's, it's almost on a conceptual level that I think the, the work needs to be done. Um, and, and, you know, to give one example, um, I think it's quite, you know, when, when we look at actually how we're being surveyed, we're very much seen as a kind of network. We're not seen as individuals. Um, and so, you know, and anyone who's been in any kind of police interview or, or these situations, they realize that your singular account of yourself is actually the least meaningful type of uh, evidence. You say, no, no, officer, I was there because my mom lives just two blocks. It's like, no, who do you know here? Why were you calling this person on this day? So all of a sudden it starts to be these kind of fragments that actually constitute you. And you're kind of left with this kind of empty vacuum, right? Because you see yourself as this individual because society has made you so individual, right? It's done all this work to you. To you. And then you leave these interviews, like you just feel like this kind of weird naked being amongst a kind of network, a kind of collected network of phone calls and metadata and strange kind of artifacts. And I think if we could actually reclaim that kind of collectivity, if there was a way that we could, rather than respond to, to practices of surveillance with, our, with, with, with attesting our individuation and our individuality and saying we are this person, but rather actually somehow find that emancipatory kind of like tiny crumb, again, it's a crumb that allows us to see ourselves as actually a collective in the way that we're actually being, you know, um, uh, in the way we're being controlled, if you want, um, then then I think th th there could be something to that. I mean, it, it always the, these forms of power. I think they're always um, they're always guiding uh, uh, um, quite. You know, they're being guided by quite radical uh, and inventive practices of of um, of, uh, of subject formation. I think 
we should at least ride that way. If not use the tool, we should at least somehow be in its conceptual orbit. Um, yeah. I, I love that the imagining others as, <laughs> imagining oneself as the fragments that others imagine constitute you within a network. I mean, I think a big part of answering surveillance is understanding what fragments you are constituted of at any one moment, being able to read before you're read or maybe hopefully at the same time um, and understand like the gap between like my real self, my real express self, whatever that is versus the fragments. Um, and I think below that is like the model of the human that's assumed within these networks of like me as a universal with both of you ide acting identically across technological systems despite moving like in the world, obviously very differently. Yeah, it's just really well said. Yeah, thank you both. That was um, incredibly interesting and um, I was actually thinking a lot of the role of collectivism and how the individual relates to the collective. And I was thinking both rep practices rely on a very close dialogical relationship with a particular territory. And so I'm thinking of um, Lawrence, your work across the Middle East at large in Syria and Lebanon and the uh, Palestine-Israel conflicts. And Conversely, Nora, you've done uh, such extensive work and research on predictive policing in the USA context. Um, and so I guess in talking about these algorithms and this violence of surveillance, is there a non-reductive way to address the planetary scale and how can we, if at all, um, effectively move across these registers whilst remaining grounded in a particular geography and temporality? So what's their ideal kind of interdependent dynamic? Uh, Nora, if you wanna kick us off. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I guess in the, in the case of Predpol, Predpol is mapped atop local practices of violent policing that are the foundation and predispose police departments to using Predpol. Um, Predpol or predictive policing affirms and helps violent policing look like the way things are and have been and will always be it creates another um it, it but but any of these technologies can be copied and pasted into any city state country or locale it's it's a model and system and simulation of the same concept and process that's enacted locally based on local data and interpretation so yes we have predpol in new york and la and detroit but predpol can be used in kampala or in dhaka it, how predictive policing would be expressed locally would det be um, dependent on the local crime data. So in some countries, homosexuality is heavily criminalized and others just any kind of vague anti-state sentiment. So those arrests then create crime data, which then creates the geographic zone of criminality. So the crime data produces a zone that's predicted to have crime and then that zone is policed. So, you know, in the data produces the territory, as if we're talking about geography. Um, but computation is also like dependent on statistical prediction, which you know, there needs to be an idea of a user with a set of predictable metrics, whether that's criminality or like whether you should get a loan or not. Um, but I guess at this moment, like, we have more people looking at simulation as a science that evolves as we all endured with the pandemic simulations changing from day to day, week to week, statistical prediction is a science that evolves as well. And so, you know, people, how people move across different territories, cities versus rural space across you know, different countries, across culture, I think will start to be, is starting to be seen as a space of um, improvement within predictive science and algorithmic science is that you need a more dimensional idea of how people move across space based on like the history context and space in which they're rooted like they're the real self that we keep coming back to so hmm. yeah i mean um i mean it's 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 um in relation to 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 localities. I mean, I think there's there's a few things. Yeah, I mean, of course, the work needs to be done, you know, across and to, to find the relations. I mean, let's say like, 
okay, perhaps the big difference between um, and, and, and the intended difference between, let's say, um, the work I did for Amnesty International on Saidnaya Prism and the film I made, Wall on Wall, is that um, uh, that there, that Walden world, you you can come away from one of those things. Say they both deal, you know, in, in uh, with the prison in a way, uh, but you can only come away from one of those things really with the response. Isn't it terrible what's happening in that one place in Syria, right? Which is, so so what I'm trying to say is that a kind of humanitarian logic allow again for these sort of small localizations, these kind of ways in which violence is always singular. And what I was trying to do with the works that I made independently and subsequently that was, it was really trying to reflect on um, what those people had taught me about uh, much more fundamental things, architecture, uh, relationship to memory, relationship to violence, uh, uh, you know, lot, I learned so much that it was it was trying to use the works to account for that, and the only way to account for it is to see it in its broad, to see to test what they were telling me about that one place, and to see it in relation to to powers outside. Um, let's say that's why it can talk. You can use Saignaya to speak about Oscar Pistorius, right? About about very specific forms of domestic violence. Um, um, and um, and and the and the, the sort of relationship of the inner walls of the home and this kind of thing. So it was, if you see what I mean, I think there's always a resistance in the work to do exactly not not to do the the, the kind of like um, uh, not to not not to see them as singular events. And and again, like um, the um, the the what you refer to in Palestine was the same. It was. In all, you know, I, I, I try to, to do this in writing. I've never done this in, in a work, but I, I've done a kind of uh, comparison, not comparison, but, um, you know, the, the summer that um, two teenagers were, were shot dead in, uh, in Palestine, uh, sorry, May uh, 19, uh, 2014. Um, it was a weird thing that we were investigating because we were essentially doing it. Um, uh, you know, you're you're looking at two deaths when, of course, there are so many, right? And so so much injustice. So so again, the, the, the kind of urgency of, of the humanitarian work always demand this kind of reduction of violence to its singularity. But what was so you know incredible is that uh, just I think two months later, uh, Ferguson erupts, right? And then you 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 have for the for the very first time in a long time, or at least in, in my generation, you have you know an understanding of of those two um, uh, 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 violences being deeply interconnected. And again, that has resurfaced with, of course, the painting of George Floyd on the wall in Palestine, um, and you know. I assume free, you know, I've seen Palestinian flags and, and stuff like that in the Black Lives Matter protests. So this, you know, with the killing of Michael Brown and the killing of these two boys, it, it's not just that it's it's racist violence that does it. There was all these connections that you, you start to find. Um, and uh, at the heart of it was a kind of uh, um, a, a way of interpreting the, the, the sound of those gunshots. Um, in the sense that, um, uh, one hand, you know, uh, to discount um, uh, ear witness testimony um, as unreliable, um, as and that's a kind of ultimate technology of the court, right? Just to sort of like take the thing that proliferates the furthest and say, no, no, only people who saw it, who were there, who again, these kind of forms of isolationism that keep getting applied. And when you speak about sound, of course, and specifically gunfire, you're talking about um, huge propagation of sound, right? So, so many witnesses are brought into the, the space of the crime um, than those who, who are close enough to see or, or whatever else. So in, in both Michael Brown and, uh, and uh, uh, the Nakbide killings of um, Hamad Abu Dahar and um, uh, Nadim Nawara, 
you had um, you had this this kind of uh, negation of the ear witness, and uh, on the one hand, uh, what made it uh, incredibly um, meaningful in um, in looking at the the kind of um, the comparison of those two those two events um, was um, this when, when you start to look at them more closely and the kind of uh, the the audio artifacts that start to merge or the audiovisual artifact, what you would see is that they were both they both captured in the same moment this um, spectacular violence and quotidian violence at the same time, and that that was their power in the sense that what you have with Michael Brown is this recording of his death. Um, you have the gunshots that that killed him by fired by Darren Wilson, and um, uh, um, uh, uh, who's still free, by the way, of course, as we know. So he, he fired all these shots. Um, I think it, so eight of them hit Michael Brown above the torso. Um, and, uh, and then a shot spotter, this technology, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is like a very long answer. I just didn't know how else to answer. I knew going into this is gonna be long. So you should stop me, Martina, anytime if you, if you, if you want. Um, You're welcome to finish your answer. Okay, I will try and finish it. So, so what I'm trying to say is that sh um, um, uh, shot spotter, which is this technology that's used all over the U.S. to to identify gunshot sounds, um, uh, they actually produce their own acoustic analysis of uh, those uh, uh, gunshots, um, and they said that okay, according to the echo profile, Darren Wilson wasn't moving forward, so the echo didn't change. Um, and therefore, um, uh, we we say that uh, he was in his right because Michael Brown was was uh, therefore the one moving towards it. Discounted a lot of other witness testimony um, uh, that said that he was moving towards Michael Brown. Um, and so, what I'm trying to say with that is, um, well, th this technology has, of course, never been used in a in a um, Again, coming back to the master's tools point, this technology, which is essentially recording all gunshots, including police gunfire, has never once been invoked to, and it has all of the records been invoked to uh, to record police violence uh, and police gunfire. It has only been used in court when it concerns uh, citizen gunfire. So um, uh, this is like a side point, and I think maybe. Uh, I should just finish here because this is now getting into the weeds and I have to unpack this point, I need, I need more time. But my, my, my point is essentially um, that it, it's always important to, 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 to measure these in relation to each other and to see the different ways in which technology bears down upon the senses uh, of, of the people whose, whose violence is exited upon. No, actually, thank you for that. And um, in a way brings me to something else that I wanted to talk about, which I was thinking when you were talking about the concept of the this reduction of violence to a singularity that to me sounds like just the other face of this persistence, um, persistent debate over who gets to be fully human, who's accounted for. So minorities, displaced people, um, people that have been ejected from their land. Um, and so this kind of brings new questions of access to and distribution of technology. And it was quite interesting that you were now talking about rubber coated steel, because this is something that I was thinking a lot about in reference to that um, piece of yours in the way that I thought it was so uh, poignant, the fact that there was a moment there where you recognized that those um, people that were there during that uh, tremendous murder, those two murders actually, um, were them the expert witness more than anyone else. And I remember in the assessments of um, the different type of bullets, so the actual rubber bullets and then the live ammunition, that the reaction of the people there were different. So mm -hmm. that kind of made me think about um, what are the ways to collapse this distance between the machine and these subjects who are actually subjects that are very much removed 
from the deployment of computation in terms of they're perhaps still very used to armed conflict and to physical dispute um, rather than being um, in a space where they have a chance to fully intellectualize and think through the ideology of code, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, you know, it, it comes from your first relationship to technology. If, if, if you're a teenager, um, uh, protesting um, unjust detention of someone outside of fair prison um, in the West Bank, and you've been there many times, then yeah, I mean, you will, you will have a, a preconditioned notion of, of, of who and how and what controls um, uh, the technology and, and, the, and, the, and also, you know, an expanded sense of technology, the courtroom as a kind of technology um, uh, and what it means to, to, to even participate in, in a kind of uh, uh, its languages, its discourses. And then I think in that film, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, unravel that in the end, that all the time you're kind of, you're rooting for them to appear in the courtroom. But of course, at the end, it's, you recognize that that's, that's impossible um, and it's redundant. It, it, you know, it, 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 it's not for them to be there. Um, and yeah, again, this is what I meant before of the, the kind of relation of the, of the quotidian and the spectacular violence that you would see that there was a learned habit of responding to um, the very fine distinction between a, a live ammunition fired through a rubber bullet adapter and rubber bullets fired through a rubber bullet adapter. Um, that meant that the, the crowds responded in totally different ways and, and again, it was about listening to how people listen. It wasn't even about listening to their speech. It wasn't even about, you know, and I think that's where the real productive work came in. Um, and something that I've tried to carry with me in other kind of political exercises to listen to how people listen, I think is, uh, is incredibly productive. And, and I think that, yeah, that sort of comes back to, to a question of a relationship to technology, but I think a more kind of expanded one. Yeah. I would also add that areas most removed from computation are also directly affected by computation. Yes. So people are living the output of design that has neo-colonial, neo-imperial expression, and there are different levels of surveillance. So you know, surveillance of uh, Rohingya refugees through biometric tracking is not, I, I don't speak of that in the same way. Um, as surveillance through contact tracing on your iPhone. They're both surveillance, but one is used to keep people on the grid and manage camps, but has an urgency or life and death import um, that's different from iPhone contact tracing. So the methods are similar and identical because the design is deployed across the world regardless of difference, but how the Rohingya live in camps in Dhaka is affected by social media harassment taking off like fire, you know, like wildfire to gather people along lines of fear. So I capture and control and managing is itself a very effective social algorithm. So design would need to account for a global system across all of these conflicts we're describing and national and cultural boundaries by deconstructing, I think, for, foremost that idea of a universal user. Um, and also as Simone Brown writes at length about along with Jackie Wang, um, we are not we and surveillance touches everyone differently. We also surveil, we're served by the logics of capture and policing, we police and capture as well. So I think deconstructing the we and making that more um, rich is also important in these conversations. Where do we find ourselves within a surveillance infrastructure? Um, who is debating whether minorities are fully human? I'm, I'm personally not debating that. So it's critical to differentiate between the, the deployment of computation tools um, in technologically plugged in societies and in ones most removed as actually having a ton of similarities. So um, I think I will ask one, I think more question and then maybe I wanted to open it up to the public. So. I would invite anyone who's in the Zoom conversation to think through what you want to ask Nora and Lawrence and perhaps type it in the chat. I saw that there was a few um, 
action in there. And um, so the last thing that I wanted to know is perhaps um, a slightly more um, personal question in regards to your own practices. As I was recently listening to this interview with J.K. Wong um, on the way that she came to uh, composing the text that later became Cast World Capitalism. And in this conversation, she talks a lot about the risk of abstraction implied in talking about computation and the importance to stay connected with the on the ground impacts of these systems. So as a response to this need, I remember she um, mentions found that she found it necessary at various points in the book to narrate the every day. And she refers to this um, autobiographical meditations as a way to ventilate the text. So that kind of made me wonder um, in engaging with your own practices, um, how useful it is to maintain a distance from the various machinic ensembles that you look at, um, or whether it might be more productive to weave the quotidian and your own lived experience into your research. Um, and uh, maybe wanted to have Nora respond to this one first, just because I know you have a background in fiction and yeah. Yeah, I have a, I think I have a pretty brief answer. I just think it's very important to make theory about computation legible and accessible, especially as we just dis discuss um, class access and accessibility to these conversations. So everyone should have ownership over a debate of how tech should be designed or what technologies we should live with. Um, I think the language around this field is designed to be very inaccessible, like everything is designed. So for everyone to access name and describe the problematics we're talking about, um, making it embodied, making it legible through narrative, like what is happening when you pick up your phone, what happens when you post a comment, what happens when you cross the street and how are, you know, like your street lights being controlled by an algorithmic network, just narrating how these logics of capture and prediction enact themselves from day to day is um, I think, the work of like narration or like expand like an expansive criticism but another is to, to then translate how it changes our relationships think of each other conceive of ourselves and conceive of subjecthood how we talk and speak is also the work of speculative fiction art and fiction as well to do that to do that work to help people plug in to how do these theoretical concepts like how am i living them how am i speaking to others how am i approaching others through these like models of um, subjecthood and control and capture and like how am I enacting them without even realizing it? and how do I gain distance from that to see my role within these within these spaces so maybe not that brief an answer that's yeah uh yeah I mean I think you know I, I touched on this a little bit before I think Again, I mean, it's this fine line between like, I'm not definitely not advocating for the kind of ma appropriating his master's tool approach, but w the moments where I've learned the most are the moments where I subjected or participated in the, the politics that I, I feel I, I was initially just wanting to throw out. That doesn't mean I came around to that political space. In fact, always the opposite. I, I returned to even a more radical position than when I be, where I began, but just going through the, the the kind of process. And again, I mean, seeing as we were talking about it, um, uh, you you know, you could you could say that. Uh, so uh, when I when I was asked to to analyze the gunshots that killed those two teenagers in Palestine. Um, you know, I initially thought, well, that's that's kind of already a compromised politics because what I'm being asked to do is define the, the, the distinction between a rubber bullet and a steel and a, and a live ammunition. When you think both are horrible and lethal and why, you know, you're basically in the work of, of defending the use of rubber bullets. In fact, not only defending, promoting it, you know, and you see so, how so much of, of human rights is, is is actually advocating for, for violence um, at its core. Um, and so, you know, but I did it because, you know, the, the, the father, Siam Nawada, 
was was actually even like taking his son, exhuming his son's body, subjecting himself to total political compromise, uh, being humiliated by you know Israeli officials who were telling him you know his son was doing this and that, and you know so so again I saw him and I thought okay well I mean that's okay if he's willing to do it then why should I not also you know compromise this there's there's something urgent and, he, and this this was the nature of the inquiry so we do it and. What you start, what, what quickly you start to, to occur is that not only is it, um, well, not only was this case then able to be twisted to argue um, uh, that they were killed by live ammunition, it was the, it was a total antagonism to rubber bullets itself. It was trying to say that, um, uh, it, or, or what, what occurred is that the, that the, the 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 kind of logic of human rights and the violence that was being um, uh, that was happening there were so entwined that a critique of one ultimately led to the to the critique of the whole kind of systemic violence that was that was propping this thing up. I.e., the soldiers knew that the appearance of firing rubber bullets would protect them from international scrutiny. So then, rubber bullets were there as a kind of alibi for which every third bullet could use be used to fire alive. Right. So. The whole mechanism of, of, of the less lethal violence was actually being used as a stage for much greater violence, right? And so it was impossible to, to separate them again and again. Lawrence, I think we might have missed you there. Let's see if he comes back. So whilst we wait for him to come back, which hopefully will be soon, I guess there is a very small follow-up that I wanted to um, ask to both yourself and Lawrence, which is um, why did you both eventually come to a conclusion where you decided art would be a good tool um, to intervene in this space? And, it comes from, again, knowing that you have perhaps a different background. Um, and so, and Lawrence as well with his experience with the legal tool, for example, and so what's, what's, the, um, what's the reason and what's the merit in choosing art as a vehicle to kind of explore, expand and criticize um, just different methodologies. Sure, I think in the space that I'm in where most of the artists that I write about or review or work with are working with emerging technologies in some way or thinking about the ethics of technology or thinking about the design of it, um, have a little bit more of a loose space in which they can have conversations that are much harder to have in a design and engineering space, at least the spaces that I've been in where, um, you know, a two hour panel on the ethics of what is being designed. There's not often a lot of space for that. I found that less than thinking that art is an effective tool of intervention, I think art does create a space for these conversations to happen. And so for myself as a critic, it's been easier to have conversations about um, how policing changes our um, ideation of ourselves in relation to each other through constant surveillance that is happening in the tech space, but in terms of like creating theory, art has often been the space in which that happens a lot. And so I find a lot of collaborators and other people to work through the language or the lexicon that's emerging around these ideas. So many of the conversations that I've had over the last five years around surveillance have happened in spaces like news center and spaces like 
um, uh, school for poetic computation in New York, where you have a lot of people who have worked for tech companies, um, have worked as engineers, have worked as programmers for a long time, but slowly found themselves through the practice of uh, artist research methodology in which they're combining both their scientific research method or their computational research with the affordances of art um, to get to play and fail and make mistakes and have this space of discourse has been the space where these ideas can be worked out. Um, obviously this can happen in theory as well and in academic spaces, but art's been like a way to bridge that for the public as well. Thank you for that, Nora. Um, I'm getting signals over here of the fact that Lawrence might be off the grid now. Um, so let's see if we're able to get him back. But in the meantime, I see there's a few um, questions that are popping up in the chat box. And um, I think there is one specifically addressed to you. Um, so I think Car from the, oh, <laughs> hello, Lawrence. My connection cut <laughs> completely. And I it's get fine. The, this is what happens when we have to <laughs> do things in such a way. But glad to, to have you back. Um, I was just uh, briefly asking Nora, I guess, as a follow up to what we were talking about. Um, so why, um, why art um, has been your kind of weapon of choice and especially with your experience and I guess with your experience of legal proceedings and seeing how um, NGOs work and how human rights work, um, what makes you come back to art as a productive site to investigate and kind of resolve these kind of questions? Uh, to, to me? Yes, to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's a continuation of, of, the, of the question um, that I was trying to answer before, that it, it, it's really important to, you know, in, in my work to uh, subject my voice listening to me in the same scrutinies of, of that which I'm talking about. I think it's, that's why I'm in the work. A lot of people ask me why, you, you know, that's there. And, and I think, the point is that if you're really speaking about the politics that's invested in the voice, uh, as soon as it's issued from your voice, it, it's gonna kind of come back, the scrutiny falls back on you rather than on, on the, the, the subject on which it's analysis all the time. So I think it's important to have that in there um, uh, in continuation with, with the last question. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I would like to hear Nora's answer about why, why uh, you know, I mean, I think you, you kind of gave a, a really interesting point before about the necessity of narration being um, uh, a kind of put, putting this, putting computational theory to work in a way. Um, yeah, I think, uh, so my, what I was talking with Martina about in your um, hiatus was m more about the space of discourse that art makes um in which like an artistic research methodology can draw on the elements of a scientific or computational research method and then the loose affordances that art provides to to do this other kind of um forming of a lexicon around like what would a non-extractive technological design look like that often happens with artists who are working with tech or have absconded from um the world of, of software, big tech companies and have found themselves in art. Um, but to the point of narration, I think there's there's a bunch of questions in the chat that even might touch on this. Um, for myself, like my start in writing was about in game design and writing about games, specifically MMOs and RPGs that have like 100,000 pages of dialogue per single character. And so just the idea of like the, the flattening in the tech that we have is so at odds with the expression within game simulations, expression within a lot of like experimental computation in which you you can dimensionalize a person and their narrative and their expression to such a degree that having a richer baseline model for a simulation is not inconceivable. With the amount of computational power one ostensibly has, it is 100% conceivable that you could root a person 
not within that seven to not 10 second video we were talking about at the beginning, but instead draw on their life history, their context, the geographic zone in which they're in, like all of this data is available. It's how is it integrated to form a narrative of who a person is at a moment in time. So that liability of that, that one phrase or that one gesture taken out of context can then be filled in, the picture can be filled in. And that's what narrative has always done. Exactly. I, I'm I mean, a Hello, how you doing? I Good. just jumped in <laughs> waiting to basically, first of all, welcome you. And uh, also maybe like give the first question because I'm enthusiastically listening. I think I can kind of like connect, not just between our methodology and what you're involved with, Lawrence, right? But also, uh, okay, you know what? Maybe I just turn my video off because I hear that my voice is not uh, very good. So just give me one sec. I can turn my camera off. Yes, so Lawrence's methodology and maybe sort of like suggest a few things and hopefully like this can like open up like a conversation. I know you, you, you emphasized your work in sort of like analyzing and deconstructing, maybe you, you use that word, of interfaces and how that is the birthplace to, to borrow from Martina of ideology, right? Like you, you, you pointed to this, like the place of interface, which is completely accurate. And um, I've been sort of like reading and working with Alexander Galloway from 2012 when his book on interface came out. And I've been very much interested in this, in these questions. But I think what got me interested in Lawrence's work, and actually that the, the connection here is through the film that, that uh, you were referencing, which we actually showcased it in God in Reverse. It was on for a week on one of the platforms that I put together for Richmond Art Gallery in Vancouver. And, and Lawrence actually brought it up, is that sort of like, so let's start from the film. What the kids, what the kids did was basically, if we, if we take the court and the legal system as that sort of interface, the kids basically realized that sometimes in the, in, in the case of say Israeli courts, it's useless or even dangerous to try to engage the court, but you better found your own way to sort of like uh, hack the system, which is through listening and knowing like which bullets are plastic and they're safe and which ones are not, right? And in fact, this is the main point why that film was, I chose that film for the exhibition because the exhibition tries to sort of like address areas where human intelligence still is required or is still is superior, or is still has a way of sort of like getting through this problem, right? And this is sort of like, you know what I mean? That That is the limit of sort of like only limiting the understanding to the understanding of the interface because if we just use the, the language, basically, you know what I mean? It's, it's like what the hackers do or what the, what the hackers do, right? They kind of like go beyond the interface mm. and go straight into the code. And I think software studies, the cultural side of the software studies, it absolutely needs to also get into understanding mathematics, understanding how actually the actual code is not only ideological, not just the interface, but the actual code is ideological. And not only that, how to sort of like intervene without sometimes, not often, because interfaces, as you mentioned, are very important, to intervene and go around the interface and sorry for the bad language and say, fuck the interface. And I'm just gonna actually go straight into where I can actually have some kind of traction. So this is why, again, I really is one of my favorite artworks. It's the artwork I got introduced to Lawrence with quite a few years ago. And it stayed with me, including an exhibition. And I thought I should bring it up to talk about how these two sides, like the interface and sort of like the code, kind of like are both are both sides of the ideological birthplace, but also both sides of agency and hacking and intervention. Sorry yeah. for this long. I mean, I think I think it, yeah, I think I think you said it in in the second half. I mean, I think it would be a really a shame to say to reduce it to some kind of humanism and say, oh, humans still win. Because actually, I think what Nora is saying, and you know what you're super aware of, is that 
it's not ever the human is never absent right it's it's always the one uh, it, it's also so so i mean we have to understand that if this was a computational system right it would be like the algorithm is saying rubber bullets are bad right that's that's the kind of human rights algorithm it kind of goes through the world going like if, sorry the live ammunition is bad and rubber bullets are good so there's this kind of threshold of violence that the computers kind of uh, remaining in that detection of but then there's a whole other group of people who would sort of develop a whole other kind of algorithm in which to kind of um, counter that so 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 the computational system goes like okay uh, rubber bullet, uh, rubber bullet, or live ammunition. Live ammunition go to court, right? Court go to here. Do, do you see what I mean? That's the kind of logic of that system. Whereas in the other way, it's like okay, this sound run, this sound go. You know what I mean? So I think yeah, there's these kind of like multiple systems operating, and I suppose what I was trying to do is is to sort of to, to in the end of that film is is to, to show the sort of dissonance of of where, where, they, where they don't meet actually, where, where they kind of collapse into each other and where, as you say, the interface itself is told to fuck off. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and, 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 and again, and, and this, is, this, is, this is in a way, that was the only place, you, you know, okay, if you take that work, so, 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 so I had to, in order to kind of aggregate all the voices and say exactly what I wanted to say with that work, I had to uh, use fiction. I had to I had to use narrative. I had to return to the kind of um, to to a synthesis of those voices. Partly because they can't be included. Partly to show the silence. Partly to you know see where suppression of sound and silence is uh, oppressive, and to see where it's actually a form of resistance and, and, and has this other uh, attraction. So I think it's, um, it's really, it was the space of fiction or art or synthesis or whatever we want to call it that actually allow it to, to, to be able to make the claims that I needed to make with it. And in no other circumstance, coming back to what Nora is saying, was that possible, right? And I'm not saying it's like the perfect place, art, utopia, whatever, not at all, but it, 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 it still allowed for, you to synthesize your own form of truth production. And that has really negative connotations, um, which refer to, again, you know, insider trading, uh, the whole way that, you know, it, it, the same reason we love that ability to do the, this kind of strange, ambiguous work of, um, of synthesizing our own forms of making truth are also why it's, um, it's quite easily corruptible. It's, it's subject to um, uh, different forms of financial speculation, etc. So, I mean, again, these are always fronts that show the emancipatory force and the 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 kind of oppressive one. And I, I think that's uh, that's yeah, kind of linking back those two two points. Just to just to house. leave, I just I just want to like fa fa thank you all for this great conversation. I've uh, been just listening in the background, but I also want to say one more word that is like. A film made a few years ago is, I'm so proud of this work, Lawrence, because it's still very relevant. And we talk about it as if it was made yesterday. No, true. It's like, you know what I'm talking about. So it's like, again, it's a great work. And maybe I just haven't made anything else worth talking about. Just, no, you okay. made, you made a lot of good stuff. It's just like we're in the United States and we're mm. like, these kind of works needs to be talked about again. You know, I mean, I follow your career. You may right now the moment we are requires us to look at that film and, and it just came up very organically you know you know like i think the, the question of the film came up very organically and you know I, I just thought kind of like bring up why i really like it and why i connect to it anyways thank you Ashley, yeah i mean others. i mean actually it's surprising for me because you know i i've been also i watched your lecture nora on the, the, the one i could find on youtube um okay. i don't remember where it was but actually, there's, I thought this conversation was going to go in a completely different direction, which, which was to do with kind of metaphor, actually, and, um, and kind of referencing your use of, sort of, uh, of that as a kind of language which we, we don't have um, the capacity yet to speak or to account for. Or, mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, so it's, it is, yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I, I was hoping to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe our next session. I mean, Mohammed, if I could, and could I have a 
absolutely, I would, absolutely. <laughs> I would love to say screw the interface. I would, I think I'm probably like as a writer trapped in like the symbolic games of the interface, like in ways I'm trying to escape from. And and Galloway and, and Wendy Chen's, both of their works on the ideology of neutrality are very like important for my think, thinking. Um, but I wonder, like the the interface is the is the zone most people have access to. Most people don't have access to the the ideological games of code. Less people can intervene there. Most people uh, can't like get to like the agency of hacking and intervention on the code level. And and I think there is an important translation from the ideology and extraction of code to the interface. So, for example, in Predpol, Predpol uses an earthquake algorithm that predicts zones of excitement and activity, which is then translated into human risk. But the printouts of the police use print out red squares that present that as like the fact of what is, like here is where crime will happen. And so the translation between the code infrastructure as political to the, the neutral interface seems where most people can, like that's where the gap occurs for people to understand that code is political and the algorithm is political. So. I guess maybe I'm just trapped there, but I'd love to I'd love to escape the interface at some point too. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, so I think we might have just five more minutes. If you guys don't mind, maybe I'll go back and look at one of the questions from um, the people that are looking at the conversation. Um, so I think, there is a um, question from one of our researchers, Federico, who is asking, I think to you both, if computational tools undoubtedly belong to an ideological domain, is there nevertheless room for an aesthetico political response to this ideolo ideological use without moving in a regressive manner? Can these technologies be politically radicalized and reappropriated rather than abandoned as inherently biased and violent? So if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so uh, going back to the killing of Michael Brown, I think, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's an example there uh, that I didn't get to touch on before. The, the gunshots that recorded his death were recorded while someone was sending a message on an app called Glide. Um, and they were sending a voice message. While they were sending the voice message, they, uh, in the background were, were the shots of Michael Brown. Uh, what, he, what the person was saying on the phone was like, it, they were like sexting, actually. Uh, they were like saying like, you're so fine, just looking at your videos. It was someone like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, like... Uh, I see. Uh, yeah, it's like maybe, you know, hitting on slash possibly whatever. Um, anyway, the point is that, so, so this recording is played with this kind of very, uh, uh, with this content at, at, the, at the beginning of it, which is about kind of desire, which is on a totally different order to the violence that, they're being, that we're, we're being asked to listen to, which is in the background of it. And nevertheless, the person acknowledges the shots because they pause, wait for the shots to finish and continue. And, um, and, and, and what I was trying to say with that recording is that, you know, that recording circulated in, in the whole story of Michael Brown. Um, and every uh, forum in which it, it was played back, it was asked, please do not listen, even to the grand jury, do not listen to what he's saying, do not be distracted by it. Listen only to the gunshots in the back, right? That is what is of central legal importance. But what, you know, so, 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 so it's only to take that recording and to say, no, no, listen to what he's saying. Listen to the interplay between the foreground and the background. Listen to the pause that he acknowledges of someone being shot to death and the continuation afterwards to understand the extent to violence in those communities. And to really understand, again, like I said, this kind of folding of the spectacular and quotidian violence, the fact that this could be something just that's not ignored. And I don't mean to say like that. Uh, and I don't mean to accuse the guy of that thing, but I mean, that is just so um, uh, a condition that is so not experienced by a, a, a huge 
a percentage of other kind of ethnic peoples of, of the United States. So, 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 so again, it, it was these, these, these kind of overlay of these recordings to ask not of the, to, to, to ask of the exact same material, a different uh, uh, type of listening um, and to demand uh, uh, that we, we, we don't take the kind of shot spotter line, the shot spotter mode of analysis, and in fact, understand the one point, not, not the delay between the, the echoes as, as a kind of symbol of whether someone was moving or not, but actually to, to account for this 1.8 second pause between you're so fine and I'm just going over some of your videos. And that 1.8 seconds where the, the eight shots rang out. So again, understanding his gap, that silence, the interplay between the foreground, the, everything was there and, 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 and that whole recording had, had circulated widely. So again, it's, it's, it's not that we should just throw out everything and the way they listen and, and throw away the evidence and there's no form of argumentation because of, of the legal gymnastics involved in order to get Darren Wilson off. It was there and, 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 and it just demanded that, that we ignore how we were being told to listen and, and to reformulate that. I think um, the question of can these technologies be radicalized and reappropriated rather than abandoned as inherently biased? I think um, in the court of like witness and interpretation that we that Lawrence has been describing beautifully, like there's also the opportunity for, for example, Predpol was uh, uh, reformatted into a newer technology to look at like past gang affiliation in Los Angeles and something that was being like tested in um, some AI conferences a couple of years ago. And a crucial part of it that was suggested is that when the police have the report that's like created by Predpol on like one's gang affiliation, usually that data would be five years old or six years old, and the person had moved on and had a totally different life. And so it was critical for um, there to be like a one page narrative that's read alongside the understanding of that tool as ideological. So Predpol had taken in critique of, of their amazing, horrible tool and suggested actually narrative to be part of the process of interpretation. Many of those reports were found blank and like the narratives are not filled in or written in. Um, but that story of helping slow down the, the flattening of someone from two seconds of being at one place like near a liquor store in the middle of the day being interpreted five years later as like some tell of who they are as a human being the narrative would account for um you know interpretation of like they're changing over time like that they're this like one flattened data point is not representative of who a person is and so the slowing down and making dimensional and putting people into context i think is within the field of interpretation like that is where that work would happen and then i think also radical new technologies can be imagined outside of the ones that we we have absolutely so thanks so much to both of you i'd like to keep this conversation going for much longer but i'm afraid we've uh, run out of our allocated time um, so before we go, I just wanted to make a quick announcement that we're not going to be hosting an episode next week. Um, we'll be back on Tuesday, the 7th of July with a conversation between uh, Jason Mohagin, Mohagi and Thomas Moinian, uh, hosted by Federico Nieto of the new Center for Research and Practice. And once again, thank you so much to Lawrence Abuhamdan and to Nora Khan for having spent this wonderful hour with us and thank you martina for your great questions and yeah, thank you insights. so much guys and you, I, it was great thank you guys i uh, hopefully we'll see you both very soon have a lovely rest of the day goodbye everyone bye, bye.